Hi, my name is Joy Verity. I'm one of the nurse practitioners at the Breast Center, and um, welcome to the mastectomy class. We're providing you with a DVD um, to go over instructions on what to expect um, for your mastectomy. We know it's a very hard process to go through, and we just try to make as much things as easy as possible for you guys. So it's a little bit um, easier to go through if you know what to expect, and especially for your family members also. So if they're available, we'd love to have them also watch this video with you um, so they know how to help take care of you. So in your package um, at your surgeon's office, you should have been provided a um, bag full of um, goodies. Um, and go ahead and open that up. And the first thing that you're going to have a, is a folder that has um, your instructions in there. So just open up your folder, and then on the left-hand side of your folder, we have the um, important pieces of information, so that's why we put it on the left-hand side for you. The first thing that I'm going to go over with you is the shopping list, and it's just nice to have things at home um, that you don't have to feel like you after you have surgery to go get, just to kind of prepare yourself. So we're going to go over that shopping list. Um, I want you guys to have a safety pin. Um, I know it sounds strange, but the bigger the safety pin, the better. Um, and some of a lot of these supplies, you can sometimes even get them at the dollar store. Um, I want you guys, if you're able to take Motrin, Ibuprofen, or Advil, any three of those are great. Um, just make sure you have a supply of that at home for afterwards for your pain control. Um, we love gauze. Um, gauze is a great thing to help with um, some of your dressing changes later down the road. It's going to be really interesting. Um, you're not going to have to worry about a lot of dressing changes because I know that's a lot of anxiety producing for a lot of patients. Believe it or not, um, one of the things that um, in your package also that you guys will have is specific instructions what your surgeon wants. Believe it or not, we work with a whole bunch of different surgeons and they all like a little bit of different things. So this will be the preference per your surgeon. One of the things is on that they'll let you know when you can take off your first dressing. And believe it or not, the first time you take off your first dressing is your first follow-up visit with them. So you're not going to be doing dressing changes when you're at home. Um, so, but it's nice to have some gauze in case for something, something happens to your dressing, if it gets wet and you do have to change it, or down the line. So we do want you guys to have some gauze. It's quite helpful. The other thing is we want you to have scissors, and I just want you guys to have a clean pair of scissors. So please just don't take it out of the drunk drawer and use it to cut gauze or tape. So um, just make sure it's nice and clean. The other thing that we like you guys to have is tape. Um, paper tape is just a little bit more friendlier to your skin than plastic tape, so just get some paper tape. And then gloves. Gloves, you do not need to have sterile gloves. We just want you to have gloves at home that um, in case whoever's helping you with dressing changes or helping you with drain, um, um, emptying your drains, if they need to have that, they can use the gloves, and that's just more to protect themselves. Um, the other thing that we want you guys to have is Ziploc bags. And what we want the Ziploc bags for is um, sandwich Ziploc bags. Um, and basically what that is is to put your dressing changes in the Ziploc bags. And so um, down the line if you do have to do dressing changes. The other thing that I had more of my patients call and complain about um, when they had their mastectomies, and we started this class about seven years ago, and it was they were more uncomfortable from being constipated than they actually were from the surgery themselves. So, and believe it or not, what causes that constipation is a lot of times is the pain medication and the narcotics that you guys are, are on. So what we recommend is that you get some stool softeners, just get them over the counter and take them as directed. Um, and so, and thought of that too, I want you guys to increase your fiber. So fiber cereals in the morning. The other thing is sometimes taking dried um, apricots or dried prunes does help too. Um, and it's really important because you don't want to go in with a problem with constipation with surgery. So I would probably take your stool softeners a couple of days before surgery. Um, and um, that will help you a lot. You only need to take the stool softeners until you're off the narcotics. And then once you're off the narcotics, you can stop taking your stool softeners. Um, the other thing is I need to make sure everybody has a working thermometer at home. Most of us haven't used a thermometer in years, and so I just want you to make sure that you take it out and make sure the battery is still working. One of the reasons why is if for some reason you call the surgeon with a concern of an infection and you haven't taken your temperature and you don't have a thermometer, they don't really like the answer of when they want to ask you what your temperature is and you say, I'm not, I don't know what it is. So just make sure you don't have to take your temperature throughout the course um, post-op, but it's just in case they're concerned about infection. Um, pillows, I just have to tell you guys, pillows, pillows are going to be your best friend through this whole thing. So one of the things in your bag, you'll see that you guys all got a heart pillow. And I'll show you what it looks like. This is what a heart pillow looks like. 
and what we use the heart pillow for for a whole bunch of different things. Um, one of the things is when you guys are post-op um, after anesthesia, you're going to want to open up your airways the first day when you get home. And so this is really great to use to splint your incisions. So whatever side, or if you're doing bilateral, you just want to splint and cough to open up your airways. The other thing, this is a great pillow, you guys, for a hug pillow. People want to give you a hug and they're afraid to touch you. Put the pillow in front of them and let them have it give you a big hug. And you know what? We have um, cats and animals and dogs, so sometimes it's just nice to have that sitting on the couch in case they come up and they want to kind of crawl, crawl around you. Um, the other thing that we love the heart pillow for, believe it or not, is the side that you um, may be having surgery on that you're removing your lymph nodes. Sometimes that's more of a tender area than actually the incision from the mastectomy itself. So sometimes where this nice little heart here, it's wherever you have the lymph nodes removed, it's nice to put your arm right there and that's a great way to comfort your arm. The other thing that we use the heart pillow for too, believe it or not, is your seat belt. What do you do in the car when you're driving? People don't think about that until you start getting into the car. So what we try to do with this class is try to make your life as easy as possible and try to give you these things ahead of time. So um, use this in the car for um, your seat belts. And I tell you, I love this pillow for laugh attacks. Believe it or not, um, after the mastectomy, you guys are actually going to feel pretty good. Um, it's not a big, huge, painful surgery, the mastectomies, but it's definitely very much an emotional surgery. So what we tell you guys is just, you know, make sure that you have this, and if you have a laugh attack and have your friends come over and visit you, this is a great thing to kind of support yourself when you're laughing. The other thing, it works great for sneezing and coughing too, just to support those incisions. So um, the other thing is, what do you guys do, um, and this is one of the big concerns I have with a lot of my patients, is um, what do you do when you sleep at night? Believe it or not, whatever arm that you have surgery on, you can't sleep on that side. And so some of you guys may be having bilateral mastectomies, and when I say bilateral, that means both breast. So if you're having a bilateral mastectomy, that means that you can't sleep on either one of your sides and you can't sleep in your stomach. So the only place that you can sleep on is your back. So if you are sleeping on, on your back, sometimes what's really, really nice is to get a big, long um, body pillow, and that way at least you can tilt. Um, so you can put it behind you and tilt onto that body pillow, and that helps throughout the night. So pillows, pillows are going to be your best friend, and believe it or not, one of the best places to sleep the first couple of nights when you get home is a recliner if you guys have one. If you sleep in the recliner, these pillows are great because you can kind of tuck them underneath your arm. Um, the other thing is if you do have one breast removed and you do want to sleep on your side, what happens with the arm that you have, the opposite one where you didn't have surgery, um, sometimes what happens or where you had surgery on, it kind of goes like this and that's what it's kind of painful. So sometimes sleeping like this on your side at night with the pillow underneath your arm is quite helpful. So um, use your pillows and have lots of different sizes. And um, a lot of times laying flat on your back is really uncomfortable for your back. So what you're going to want to do is put um, a pillow underneath your knees and just kind of take that extra support off your back. That helps a lot too. So hopefully you have lots of friends and family around just going to kind of help you with all your pillows. Now what we're going to do is we're in the next piece of paper that you're going to be looking at is um, drain care after surgery. And what I did is I gave you guys a copy of what um, our plastic surgeon's office gave to their patients, and it's just a copy of what a drain record's supposed to look like. I find that a lot of patients are quite concerned about drain care, and it's scary because you guys are gonna have drains. And this is the big, huge question that I have from patients, how long am I gonna have my drains in? And you know what, it's really hard because it just depends if you're gonna be a leaker or a non-leaker. Some patients can have their drains in anywhere from one to three weeks. The goal is to have them removed after three weeks just because we'd like to prevent um, risk of infection. So I know most patients are pretty motivated and trying to get their drains out as soon as possible. So we're gonna go and talk about how we can get that done for you. So what it is, is just so you guys know, with a mastectomy surgery, the surgeon has a great ability to cut, um, cut into the, um, the breast tissue. And think about breast tissue's fatty tissue. So, and when I was telling you that mastectomy is not a big, huge, major surgery because what it is is just cutting into fatty tissue. They're not cutting into muscle, they're not cutting into bone. So believe it or not, it's not a huge painful surgery. So what it is is surgeons will cut into your um, breast tissue and they have the great ability to use a cautery to cut off those blood vessels. So they'll cauterize those blood vessels, but those capillaries are still there and they're going to leak a little bit. So when you guys first come home, you're going to have bright red blood that's coming into those capillaries heal up. 
and it does take about three to four days for those capillaries to totally heal up. So expect to have some bright red blood in your drains, and this is what a drain will look like. Now what it is, is the drains are there for a reason. I know, um, believe it or not, they are a pain. I'm sorry. They're not fun to have in, but you know what? You really need them in there. And I think if you respect why they're in there, they're so much easier to tolerate. So what it is, is why you have the drains in there is when they cut into your blood vessels, they cauterize those, but you also have lymphatic space tissue that's in there. The lymphatic space tissue is leaks a lot. So it has a lot of tissue um, leakage of fluid that comes into it, and that's what's going to drain out. If you did not have your drain in, what will happen? That fluid would actually build up into your breast tissue, and it almost looked like you got a breast back again. And that's something that we call a seroma. And seromas are not fun because they put a lot of pressure against the incision site, and they're quite painful. And so the way that surgeons have to deal with them is you have to go into the surgical office, and they stick a syringe into your breast, a needle and syringe, and they pull out the fluid. Trust me, it's so much easier to deal with these drains at home than it is to go to the surgeon's office and have a seroma drained. So this is really why you have these drains in there, is to pull out that fluid so you don't build up a seroma, and it also helps prevent infection from that fluid staying in that area. So what happens is um, this is why these drains are going to be put in there. Now what I can tell you is in each breast, you will have one to two drains. So if you are having a bilateral mastectomy, you can have up to four drains, okay? Now what happens is their drains are put in um, into you. So this part, and all drains look a little bit different, but this, this is what this drain looks like. There's a whole bunch of tiny little holes in here, and the drain uses a suction to pull out the fluid from your breast to go into the bulb. Okay? So what's going to happen is this is going to be into your body. And um, all you're going to be seeing is this part sticking out at the bottom, and this is going to be held in by a stitch. Just so you guys know, I'm going to just stand up real quick to kind of show you where to expect where the drains are going to be coming out. They're going to be coming out more down towards this area, and um, they're not going to be up high, but you're going to be having, so when you come out of the operating room, you are going to see a dressing down here, and that's where, you're going to, um, that's where the drains are coming out. And then you'll also have a dressing on the mastectomy site. Okay? So, and like I say, you may have up to two of these there. Now, these, what we do with these with drains, so you have the drains to get the lymphatic space tissue out. The other thing that the surgeons do when they do surgery is they also cut into nerve spaces, just so you know that. And when they cut into nerve spaces, just so you guys know, expect that when you get out of surgery, your breast is going to feel numb. And it's kind of just an odd feeling just because you're so used to having a lot of sensation in your breast tissue, but it's going to feel numb. And so um, just know that's normal. The other thing, if you guys have what's called a sentinel node, and just to kind of review what a sentinel node is, sentinel means guarding. So it's the first lymph nodes that are guarding from your breast. So when your surgeon, and you guys know that you'll have a sentinel node done if you go to nuclear medicine first before you go to surgery. And in nuclear medicine, they inject that dye in contrast around the nipple area to identify the first couple lymph nodes, the sentinel nodes that are guarding the breast for you for, um, during the surgery, the surgeon will remove just one to two of those. Now, if you do have the sentinel node, you will have some numbness in this part of your arm. So I just want you guys to know that is normal. I don't want you to feel like the surgeon did something wrong and they cut a nerve or something, but it's very normal. It takes a year for nerves to grow back. So you will get some sensation back, not total sensation, but you will get some sensation. Now, if you do have to have an axillary dissection, and what an axillary dissection is, is where they remove multiple lymph nodes underneath your arm. And usually women who have to have an axillary dissection is if we can actually palpate an abnormal lymph node um, before your surgery, or if we've already biopsied um, a lymph node before, then you would have an axillary dissection, or if you've already had a sentinel node and they have to go back and remove more. Now, axillary uh, dissections are important. We'll talk about those later on. But if you do have one of those, you will have numbness that goes all the way down to here, okay? And that is very normal, and you'll get some of that sensation back. Some of my women who've had axillary dissection say their hair underneath their arm have never grown back. So I guess if you try to look for some advantages to things in life, that would be one advantage. But um, so those are the things that happen during surgery. And so the big, huge thing that we want to deal with is drain care because, remember, we want that lymphatic space tissue out of there so you don't build up a seroma. And what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about how to do drain care because it's really scary for patients about what do you do with these drains. Um, so what it is, is it's really actually quite simple, you guys. You need to know with drain care, remember, it's used as a suction, okay? So you can have the 
you can have this up here and it's going to work just as good if it's down here because it's the suction in here that's providing the fluid to be pulled out. So what you're going to want to do is always a good rule of thumb and what you guys are going to be doing is it's just like a beach ball. This is where you're going to be opening and closing this a lot. The very important thing that you guys need to know is before you touch this part of your bulb, um, you're going to want to wash your hands. So sometimes I tell you just having Purell um, sitting next to the sink or wherever you're going to be doing a drain care is a great thing to do. So you either need to wash your hands with a soap and water or you need to use a Purell. And what you do is you open up this little bulb just like a beach ball and then you guys will all be provided with a um, measuring cup um, and it's usually a little um, cup that has kind of an orangey kind of a yellow top on the top of it and it and you it has measurement but I just have a little cup here to kind of show you. So what it is is you'll open that up, you'll wash your hands first, you'll open this up and then you're going to want to get some uh, all of that liquid out, okay? And just to kind of warn you, it does get stringy and kind of gooey, okay? So what's going to happen, you're going to get all of that out and then you're going to just set this down and I never want you guys to do this over the toilet, okay? I never want anybody to drop this accidentally in the toilet. So make sure when you're doing your drain here, kind of do it over a sink area or somewhere safe where you're not going to drop it. So just kind of get all the liquid out of there. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to squeeze the air out of this, okay? And there's about three ways that you can squeeze the air. I call it the angry approach where you just kind of go like that, squeeze the air out of it, and you plug it back up. And then see how that you're having a nice, incredible suction there. The other way, and it's making that really awful noise because it's not in anybody, so. Um, and then the other way is you can roll it, roll the air out of it. It's a little hard for people with arthritis to do that, but just to kind of let you know and see how you have a great suction going on. And one of my patients taught me this the other day, too, is where you actually just push the air out of it that way and um, plug it back up. And that's going to cause that increased suction to get that fluid to pull out to get into here. Okay, and so what's going to happen is um, then you're going to go ahead and take a look and see how much fluid is coming out of this. And you're going to measure it. And then what you're going to do is you're going to go over to the toilet and then just drop that into the toilet. Rinse out the cup. The cup does not need to be sterile at all because remember it's not touching anything with your bulb. So just come on back over here and go to the next drain. So the important thing with drain care, believe it or not, is remember I told you guys if you have both breasts removed, you can have up to four drains. So what you're going to have to do for the surgeon is keep track of what's coming out in each drain. So remember if you have four drains. So if they have not labeled your drains for you at the operating room, most of them have when you're in recovery in the operating room, they'll have like A, B, C, D, or you know, left, right on there for you. If they haven't, what you can do is just pay, take some of that paper tape and kind of just put a little piece of paper tape and label it for yourself. Because the reason why you guys need to keep track of what's coming out in each one of your drains is this is how the surgeon knows when to pull out your drains. Because remember I told you some people are leakers and some people are non-leakers. So what do you do? How, when do you get these drains removed? So what it is, is you're going to keep track of the surgeon for it. So there is a copy in here, and remember I just showed you how to keep track of your drain record. So your responsibility is to keep track of each drain, what's coming out of each drain, every 24 hours. So every day you're on and record that, and it's an also important thing we're going to talk later on why that's nice to keep track of for yourself too. So what it is, is you're going to keep track of that. And a good rule of thumb, as I tell you guys, empty your drains three times a day when you go home, because I can't tell you who's going to be a leaker and who's going to be a non-leaker. Because good rule of thumb is you really never want this to be more than halfway full. Because if it's more than halfway full, you're not going to have as a good section. So um, when you first go home, empty it you know, in the morning, halfway throughout the day, and before you go to bed. You don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to, um, to do the drain care. But what you're going to want to do is and then if you're noticing that it's less than halfway full and you're not having a lot of drainage, go to twice a day, and then eventually you guys can go to once a day. So you're going to be able to figure out yourself how often you need to empty your drains, but it really just depends on what's coming out of here. So just think, remember, good rule of thumb, just never have it more than halfway full. And what you're going to do is you're going to keep track of each drain. And when you go into the surgeon's office for your post-op care, you're going to bring your drain record with you, okay? Because like I say, that's how they know when to remove it. You're going to keep track of what color is coming out of in your drain. And that's also a good important thing for the surgeon to look at, but very important for yourself too. The reason why is when you, remember I told you, when you first come home, you're going to have those capillaries are going to be bleeding. So that's, you're going to have bright red blood that's coming into this, okay? Then eventually what's going to happen is it's going to turn pink tinged and then it's going to turn yellow. 
and then so you're going to kind of know those kind of those rainbow colors now what's important if you're at yellow and all of a sudden if you have bright red blood in your tubes in here that's not a good thing that means you have new active bleeding something's going on and you shouldn't have new active bleeding after the bleeding stopped so that's when you want to give your surgeons an office a call and let them let them know what's going on okay now I love the drain record for you guys for yourselves too because this is a huge thing just to kind of let you guys know what happens is remember how I told you guys it's not a huge painful surgery so you guys are going to be pretty comfortable believe it or not um, our goal is for you guys to um, not be nauseated when you go home from the hospital and our goal is for you guys not to be um, in pain if you guys can be not nauseated and pain free you guys are going to be doing really good for your recovery so what it is is the arm that you have surgery on you're not allowed to move your arms any higher than this so if you're removing both your breast this is what's going to happen you're not going to be able to move your arms any higher than this the things that you can use your arm that you had surgery on is for daily activities so what that means is that you can use your arm for eating you can comb your hair but I don't want you to style your hair like go and use the blow dryer and use a you know the straightening iron and all that so um, you daily activity things okay because you do want to use your arms because you don't want to get a frozen shoulder but what happens is just so you guys know this the reason why we're telling you that it's not because you're going to feel awful and you're going to be in pain and you're going to hurt yourself it's more from the fact that when you do repetitive motion you increase your fluid production and when you increase your fluid production remember what do you guys want to get removed you want your drains to get removed so what it is is think about all the things that we do repetitive motion every day with and this is where a lot of women have a hard time is because believe it or not um, you know it's emptying the dishwasher <laughs> it's folding laundry it's actually using the computer using the mouse that is repetitive motion so if you're doing a lot of repetitive motion with your arm you're going to increase your fluid production and you guys are going to keep the strains in there for a lot longer than what you want to so the goal believe it or not is not for you guys not to use your arms they want you to use your arms for daily activities but I don't want you to overuse them and so this is a great way for you also to keep track of that in your drain record because if you know that you were at 60 cc's yesterday and all of a sudden you increased to 80 cc's today you overdid it so listen to your body your body's really good about letting you know so you know you overdid it what did I do today did I go driving um, that's another huge thing that a lot of patients ask when can I drive well you guys can drive when you feel like you can safely drive so it means that it means that you have to be off your narcotics and then you feel like you can have the range of motion for driving if you can have that you guys can drive but then you need to be smart about it because what happens is you know I had one of my patients who actually ended up having her drains in for almost two months and the reason why is because she um, delivered flowers for a living so what did she do she went and she drove and she drove and she drove because she felt great but guess what she increased her fluid production by that repetitive motion believe it or not driving is repetitive motion especially if you have a stick shift so um, this is where I tell you guys if you're gonna drive you gotta just do it smartly go drive to one place once a day this is not where you want to go to all your different errands over and over again and do that repetitive motion there's lots of things that we do repetitive motion so um, think about cooking you know it's the constant going up and down and stirring and things like that the other thing is what about microwaves um, you know what I tell you guys if you're going to use a microwave get one that you put on your counter um, because what it is is you're putting remember you can't move your arms any higher than this and if you do have one arm that you can use it's not safe to remove things from the microwave up high with just one arm so this is a great time for you guys to get the microwave to put on your counters this is a great I know this would drive me crazy but just um, one of the things that you guys can do is put things on your counter space in the kitchen um, I always like to have my counter space cleaned off but you know this is where maybe put some cups and you know um, plates and things things that are up high in the cupboard put them down where you can reach them because remember that's what you're not supposed to be doing um, and this is the time in the world where you know what the laundry may just not be done or the dishwasher may not be unloaded you're just gonna have to take a deep breath in and relax and just go you know what I want my drains removed <laughs> and if you just remember that as your goal um, it's a lot easier and it's just great for your family to know where they can help out because you are going to be feeling good um, but what are they what can everybody do to help out with you so that also means you know vacuuming dusting it's really kind of the cleaning stuff that you guys can't do 
you're going to feel great, but what do you do about that? So um, what I want you guys to do is kind of think ahead of time, maybe have some meals made ahead of time, like Trader Joe's has a lot of pre-made meals, have people um, make you um, sandwiches that are um, made ahead of time that you can quickly take out of the fridge that you don't have to prep a whole lot. And remember, good rule of thumb, never pick up an, anything heavier than a half a gallon of milk. So, and remember, this is a surgery that most of you guys, if as long as you're not doing any of the major deep surgeries and things like that, it, you're not using your abdominal muscles, so you guys can go up and down stairs. Um, so there's not a lot of restrictions except what you do with your arms, just with a repetitive motion, okay? And that's just our goal is really for you to get your drains out. So when you're looking at your drain record, it's a good record for you guys to just to check, you know, take note. Am I doing good? Because you know you're going well in your recovery if your drain, um, your drainage is going to be less and less every day. Now also notice the great thing that you guys can do is look at your color. If you were like yellow and then you're reversing your color and you're going back more to orange, kind of like the opposite, it means you overdid it that day. And like I say, remember your body's really great about letting you know if you overdo it. So we definitely want you to kind of keep track of your drain record that way for yourself too, okay? So just to kind of review drains, remember anytime you open this, you're gonna to wanna to wash your hands, okay? So, and it's just right here. You can clean it on the outside with a little alcohol, but really, and never inside here, you can, things are a little stringy. Don't clean the inside out with soap and water because that's a great way to introduce infection to come up here. So what you wanna do, just wash your hands and open this up take the drain out, I mean take all the fluid out, and then what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and get all the air of it out, however you guys want to, okay, and then you're going to have a nice suction going on there, you're going to put it down, and then, I know that noise, and then you're just going to take a look how much came out, and then you're going to put it into the toilet, rinse it off, and come to your next one. So really, you guys, drain care isn't too difficult, it just seems really overwhelming, and it's really hard. Um, it's nice when you guys take the class because you guys can play with this. Sorry on the video, but you guys don't get to play with it. But just to let you know, this is pretty strong and you guys really can't really hurt it. So I know it's pretty overwhelming and intimidating. Now, just so you guys know some of the helpful things that you can do with your drains, to tell you the truth, fluid goes to the least amount of resistance. So if you're building up fluid and maybe your drain isn't working so well or it's getting clogged or something's happening, where is that fluid going to go? Well, it's gonna go through your incisions. So that's why I tell you, the good rule of thumb that you guys have basically for dressing care, for your dressing, is you need to keep it clean and dry. It's really easy, clean and dry. And so if you notice, and you know that you're not supposed to see your surgeon until next week, and you know you're gonna see your surgeon in two to three days, but your dressing's wet, that needs to get removed because a wet dressing is not a good dressing. That can that can get break down of skin. It really increases your risk of infection. So if you get a wet dressing before you're supposed to change it and see the surgeon, you're going to want to give their office a call. And that's why I want you guys to have gauze in case that does happen. But sometimes where your drains are coming out, remember I told you they're going to be coming out a little bit lower. And if that is leaking, you're going to want to change that dressing also. So what's really nice just to kind of help you guys is for, um, to help you with these drains is you just kind of take your 4x4 four four gauze, cut it into 2x2s, two and what you do is you have a 2x2, two two, put a little slit into it with the scissors, and what you're going to do is you're going to put the drain like right there, okay? And so then the, the uh, gauze is going to be down here. And then that's really nice because what happens, sometimes what's really irritating is if this is starting to get breakdown of skin because it got wet where it's rubbing, is that then the drain is now rubbing against the gauze. So it's just that two by two, put a slit in it and kind of put the slit like right like that and you put some um, paper tape on that and that really helps protect your skin so it's not getting irritated and then if it gets wet you're going to want to change that the other thing is remember i told you these these are held in by stitch so if you're feeling like it's getting pulled on remember this is using a suction so what you want to do is just take a piece of paper tape and you can actually secure it a little bit easier like on a different part of your body so it's not being pulled on so take a piece of paper tape kind of secure it and then it's not being pulled. And I can tell you that is my helpful hints of um, dealing with your drains. Like I know they're not fun to have, but if you can kind of um, know why they're in there, it's a little bit easier. Um, the other thing that you guys need to do, and I know it sounds really kind of strange, is you need to do what's called milking the drain. 
And so, you know, we all have to do maintenance to, for things in life to prevent things from happening. So kind of think of it as a maintenance for your drain. What it is, is remember how I told you before, things kind of get stringy and kind of gunky in here. So one of the things before you guys do drain care is kind of a good rule of thumb is do milking the drain. And what you're doing by milking the drain is you're causing an increase in suction back here. So if things are starting to get plugged up or starting to get clogged, that milking will help pull it out so it doesn't eventually get clogged up so bad that you can't repair it and then it just has to get pulled out and then you just have to deal with it. So trust me, this is why you want to do milking the drain. And I always recommend that you do milking the drain before you do your drain care. And the reason why is because if things are getting plugged up back here and say you just did drain care, then you milk it and all the stuff comes out, then you just got to empty it out again. So it's up to you. So it's just a little bit easier to do it before ahead of time. So what happens is remember this is being held in by stitch so it's going to be stabilized. You're just going to want to have somebody stabilize it for you, okay? So you can do it yourself. You can kind of go like that or you know just kind of hold on to it however you want to but stabilize it. And that's really important because you don't want to pull on it because that may hurt a little bit. So what you're going to do is just take a little bit of water, put it on your fingers and then you go like this, okay? And what that is by doing that is you're causing an increase in suction back here, okay? So what you're going to do and it's a lot easier to do it with some water in your hand, just to let you know. And you go like this. And I've done this milking to this drain to this thing probably about a million times. So trust me, you're not going to hurt it. <laughs> and then what you do is you'll see this kind of like some of that clotty stuff come out. And then you're just going to help milk it to go all the way down into your tube. Okay? And so sometimes what you'll see, it go and you'll fill back up your tube again. So that's why I tell you you just want to kind of do it rule of thumb before you decide to um, empty your drains. And I just recommend it just do it every time ahead of time. And it's really hard. So just so you guys know, milking the drain is not this. Okay? You're not going to get anywhere in life by doing that. <laughs> so just remember, stabilize it, get some water, and go like this. And just kind of help milk whatever may have been getting plugged in there to get down. And you may not have anything. One of my patients did tell me that it was really interesting that she did notice that she had a lot of discomfort in her breast right after she emptied her drains. And it kind of makes sense because what happens is you have an increase in suction now and you're pulling out a lot of that fluid. So um, her recommendation, and I always learn so much from my patients, she says, you know, maybe you do want to take your pain medication 30, min 30 minutes before you empty your drains or just make sure you're on some pain medication during that time period. Um, and so she was just noticing that um, she eventually correlated to emptying her drains. So, but yeah, do do that sectioning. The mil it's called milking the drain. So now that is basically all that you have to do with drain care, okay? Now you guys may wonder, what do you do with your drains? So if you have four of them, where are you supposed to place them? We have the foundation. It's been really, really incredible. And I'm going to show you guys something. Um, they, each of you guys are going to be getting a camisole. And these camisoles are donated by the foundation. And so um, it's in your package is going to be information on how for you guys to obtain your camisole. Everybody gets one of them. I'm sorry, we don't have extra ones to give away. Um, these camisoles, if you want to, uh, Mary uh, Catherine's, they're a store that's in Seattle. Um, you can actually call them and see if you can get an extra camisole from them if you want to. Um, but what it is, is you guys will each, you'll get one of these, okay? And they're wonderful. And they um, Velcro up, they're really, really nice. Because what it is, is if you have one breast removed, you can't wear a bra for a while. So I'm really sorry, you're not going to be able to, the other one's just going to be there. <laughs> so um, what you're going to do is you're going to have this camisole. And this is going to be great because if you open it up, there is a section right in here for two drains. So remember, you may have up to four drains if you do both breasts. So each side has two sections. So you have room to put your drains in. Um, and this is like the most helpful thing in the whole entire world, you guys, really for you. So what you're going to do is you're going to put, I kind of call them the grenades. You kind of put them right in there. And then that way, um, it's so much easier for you to deal with that drain. What do you do with them? There you go. you got a place for them. The other thing is that each one of your camisoles comes with two softies, okay? And they're called softies for a reason because they're nice and soft and they're foamy. You guys can take out as much stuffing as you want on the inside of them. And there's a little Velcro here. And what it is, and in your camisole, there's a section for you guys to Velcro your softies in there. 
I love these softies and I do highly recommend for you guys to use them. Some people may say I don't really care but it's nice to have them there and if you don't velcro them I will tell you they'll be up here in an hour okay so you definitely want to velcro them in there. Well the reason why I love them it just makes you symmetrical or even if you remove both your breast it's nice to have them in there because it protects your incision. We have animals, we have kids, we have people who hug us. It just kind of protects those incision. And so um, you can put them in there if you want to or not, but they're there for you. And you guys do each get two of them. These are nice because later on during transition-wise, when you guys maybe aren't quite ready for a bra yet, but maybe you want to put a camisole on, you can kind of, um, and there's a shelf in the camisole, you can put these in there and kind of stabilize them in there for a little bit. So these are great little softies just to kind of help you in transition-wise down the road, okay? Um, but, so you guys will each go at one of these. One of my other patients told me that she actually ended up going just to Walmart, or you guys can look in Target, look in the athletic kind of part of the department and know the hoodies that a lot of people have, and they have those nice light, lightweight hoodies that zip up. Well, if you get them from those departments, believe it or not, they have made them now. So for everybody who has all the iPods, iPads, and the, I mean, not, probably not iPad, but iPod and iPhone, and you can open it up, and they actually have these nice little little things there so you guys can use those if you're going to want to wash this at home or you're trying to figure out you know what do you want to do with your drains if um just to, it's instead of getting an extra camisole and they're about 10 12 dollars so and they're great to use afterwards um those those lightweight hoodies okay so i'd probably recommend maybe looking for one of those ahead of time too so that's the camisole that you guys will be getting and like i said we'll have the instructions in your um your booklet and how for you guys to obtain that. And you want to get it before your surgery and you want to bring the camisole with you to surgery because you definitely want to come home from the hospital with that. Okay, so the next thing that we have in your booklet is it's called the Dear Value Client. And this is one of the important things that we need, our patients need to do. It's how, um, what happened is we we're finding some of our mastectomy patients were having some problems with rotator cuff injuries, frozen shoulders, things like that. So we do highly recommend that a lot of our mastectomy patients, depending on how you do with surgery, go off and see a physical therapist, um, just for one appointment at least, just to get evaluated to see if you have a problem. Um, we do have Maggie Strazzo's number at the bottom of it. You can go see whatever physical therapist you want to, but we do have Maggie. She's very involved with her breast cancer team and she's an expert in lymphedema. Um, and she, her office is more um, south of Everett. So just what we want you to do is um, call, so when you celebrate, when you get your drains removed, make an appointment to see a physical therapist. Because remember, you don't want to see a physical therapist before your drains are removed because you can't do exercises. <laughs> um, and so you're going to want to see them just to kind of at least have one evaluation. Now I can tell you, just to take note, for anybody who has to move on to radiation therapy after the mastectomy, you guys are the most important people that definitely need to have a radiation I mean, a, um, not a radiation, but a, um, a physical therapy consult. Because um, when you add radiation on top of with a mastectomy, this is in combination where um, some of our patients get in a lot of trouble. So definitely important for those patients to get that taken care of. Um, and your surgeon's office can, can provide you with a written prescription or referral for you to go see the physical therapist. The other thing that you'll be getting um, when you're in your post-op visit that you can get from your surgeon is a prescription for a mastectomy bra and prosthesis. And so that's how you're gonna get it covered. Um, the bad news that I have to tell you is we used to have Virginias in town um, and they closed, they were in North. And the only place that we kind of have close to us right now is um, Nordstrom's. And you can call and go get your um, fitted for a prosthesis. Um, I would recommend calling your insurance company to find out how much is covered because some insurance companies will cover a certain amount of bras every year. So just kind of find out what your insurance does cover for you. Um, the other thing, just so you guys know, we have the great um, at the Cancer Center, the Resource Center. Um, we have some volunteers always at the Resource Center, and we do have a cabinet full of things that everybody's donated, um, or we call them gently used. They've been washed and taken care of, but of camisoles, of mastectomy bras, of prosthesis. So if you can't afford it, um, it's not your insurance will cover it, but if it's just hard for you, Go in and see what they have. They have lots of lots of things there for you. So, um, and you just need to go to the resource center at the cancer center for that. Um, and then, if there's any additional information that we can find in the future for where for you guys to get your prosthesis, we'll put it in your packet for you. Um, so, those are the big huge things that I wanted to talk to you guys about. That's on the left hand side of your book. Okay. The next thing is 
what we're going to do is have the table of contents, which is, um, and we're really going to just focus on the first couple of pages. So you're going to see this. This is a nice booklet for you guys to read a couple of days before surgery, because in this class we have pretty much have gone over everything, but it's just a nice little reminder of what, okay, what, what, what to expect. Um, and it's just, you know, if you're, if you have knowledge about what to expect, it doesn't make it so scary. And that's what our goal is, is just to try to help you out with that as much as we can. So, and I always expect you guys to tell you that I expect you to be stoned <laughs> when you're discharged from the hospital. So it's kind of hard to remember what they tell you when you get discharged. So just to let you guys know, 50% um, of our patients actually go home the same day. So um, depending on where you guys have surgery, if you have surgery at Trask Surgical Center, you will be going home the same day. Um, if not, some of the patients, um, you can talk to your surgeon, but a lot of them say that you can spend the night. And it's up to you sometimes. If you're a healthy individual, um, you possibly do have the um, option to go home. Everybody's a little bit different in how they want to do with it. How this happened was they had a plastic surgeon about eight years ago who was um, sending all of his patients home the same day. And so I asked him what the advantage of doing that was. His advantage is um, sending patients home the same day. He felt like um, you have more risk of getting an infection by being in the hospital. So, which is true, I'm sorry to say. So, um, if you guys are spending the night, just make sure that people, when they come and they're going to touch you in the hospital, they're physically going to touch you, make sure that you see them wash their hands ahead of time, okay? And then the other thing, um, we have a great tower that's been built, which is so wonderful for mastectomy patients because in the past, um, people had to share a room. And the bad thing about sharing a room is you don't get to pick your roommate and you don't get to pick your roommate's family. And it's a very much an emotional surgery, so it's hard to share a room with somebody after mastectomy. The great thing about the Colby campus now, if you guys are going to be going to the Colby campus, you'll be getting a private room and a private bathroom. Now what happens is in the hospital, people like to stay in their hospital bed. And what I can tell you, remember 50% of our patients go home the same day. So we don't want you staying in your hospital bed. So if you do go to the hospital, please bring your robe with you. And it's because I want you guys to be able to, um, once you're out of recovery, I want you guys up walking about every hour, okay? And so um, that's gonna be kind of important for you. Um, the other thing is, um, for you guys to know is if you do spend the night at the hospital, do not expect to get any rest. Um, the hospital is a 24 hour day thing. It never goes to sleep. It's never quiet there. There's alarms going off, bells going off, nurses out in the hallway talking, but that's kind of their job. And so I'm sorry, and people are, um, they're paid to wake you up all night long. So if you go home the same day, you may get a little bit more rest just to kind of let you guys know. But um, the other thing is what I want you guys to do is you, if you do spend the night, that's great. I just want to make sure when you're in the recovery room, I want you to start taking some ice chips when you guys are out of recovery. And once you can tolerate those, I want you to start taking your pain medication by mouth, okay? This is really important because if you start going to the IV narcotics, those are going to get you guys almost too medicated and that's where you guys get a lot of side effects. What I find with my pain medications is you guys love to be pain martyrs. So I do not want any of my mastectomy patients to be pain mourners, but I do want you guys to be comfortable. This is how we get you guys in a really good recovery. Um, so we want you comfortable, but I can tell you, um, go ahead and start taking your pain pills by mouth. If you're able to tolerate those and you're taking fluids down, you can ask them to remove your IV or just kind of hep lock it a little bit, which is where they just put a little lock in there. Because the reason why that's nice to do that, it's so much easier to walk around and move around and go to the bathroom without an IV pole, pole attached to you. So, um, and remember, I want you up walking every hour while you're awake. You don't have to do it during the middle of the night, but during waking hours. And so, um, and I can tell you, um, at night, nurses like their patients to be sleeping. So, I really don't want you guys to get any IV pain medication. Um, if you need it, you need it. But most of our, the majority of our patients are going to tolerate just being on the pain medications by mouth. So, and you know what, a lot of our post-op patients do need that. You know, we have the knee replacements, we have the hip replacements. Those are huge, big, painful surgeries. And so those are the guys you're gonna be seeing those patients getting the IV narcotics. You guys don't have to do that. So I can tell you the worst part about the mastectomy surgery, you guys, believe it or not, is the anesthesia hangover. That's the worst part. So one of the helpful hints that I got from my plastic surgeon, the reason why he was able to send his patients home the same day is because people were able to have good pain control and they were not nauseated. Now one of the helpful hints that I can tell you guys to do it, especially if you tend to be nauseated during surgeries, because that's what a lot of fear that a lot of patients have, is there's a patch, it's called a scopolamine patch or scope patch. 
It's a patch that a lot of people use during seasickness for cruises. So you'll see it as a little, uh, little looks like a little band-aid and it's put right behind the ear. So you can possibly ask your surgeon for that ahead of time. Or um, the other thing is in pre-op, when you're in surgery before pre-op, the anesthesiologist will come talk to you. You can ask the anesthesiologist at the point for the scope, ball, the scope patch, and we all call it the scope patch. And I always tell you, I go blame it on the mastectomy class. <laughs> Throw my name out there, I don't care. <laughs> So, and just say, I want that scope patch. And so the trick with the scope patch, just so you guys know, is you have to put it on before you're nauseated. So if you put it on post-op after and you're nauseated, it's not gonna work for you. The great thing about the scope patch, it works for three days. So it's incredible, you guys. So and that's one of the things is remember, if you're in good pain control and you're not nauseated, you're gonna recover a lot sooner. So what it is is with the scope patch is you just have to put it on behind your ear. And so what I tell you, if you put it on in about mm, 30, 30 seconds after you put it on, just take note that it's not in your hair because sometimes it does get attached to the hair when you move your head. So if it's in your hair, it's not going to work. It definitely needs to be attached to your skin. Um, the other thing about the scope patch to know is that on the back part of it, it's like a Band-Aid, so it has medication on it just like the medication that you get when you go to the eye doctor to dilate your pupils. So if you actually touch it and then you touch your eye, your eye will be dilated and the other one gets really small and then you get blurred vision. Just so you know, you did not have a stroke. You just did that and you're gonna to have to wear dark sunglasses all day long. And sometimes this is more for the family who puts it on for you. Or sometimes this is when you take it off after three days. So just make sure when you put the scope patch on that you wash your hands good before and you wash them really well afterwards when you take it off. So um, that is my helpful hint to kind of help you with your anesthesia hangover. <laughs> so once you guys get past that anesthesia, you guys are going to be doing really, really good. So what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on the first page. And this is what the first page looks like, and it's your mastectomy discharge instructions. And like I said, each one of your surgeons is going to have specifically what they do for their patients in there. So just kind of review there a little bit just about um, when to expect to remove your dressing, um, when can you take your pain Motrin products, um, because that, we're going to be talking about pain control in just a little bit. So each surgeon um, has a preference and one pa patient can start their Motrin. So they'll have those um, specific things for them in your package for you, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about number one. You need to eat a well-balanced diet. Remember, you guys aren't having a big major surgery. And as long as you are not um, nauseated when you go home, you guys are going to be doing well. So just make sure that you kind of stocked up and have some good food at home. Number two, I tell you, listen to your body. Rest as you need to. Um, so when you go home, walk within your house throughout the day. And then the next day, go outside. But remember, a good rule of thumb, wherever you go, you must come back. So I don't want you to go for a big, long walk the first time. Go up and down your driveway, then eventually go around the block, and then eventually, you know, kind of, um, you can walk. But always bring somebody with you the first couple of times and bring your cell phone with you. And one of the things is also walking your dogs. Um, it's a little bit easier if you guys had just one surgery, but remember that repetitive motion thing. So if you had um, both of your um, bilateral mastectomies, walking the dog is not something you guys are going to be able to do because what do you do with walking the dog? You do a lot of repetitive motion. So this is where I want you guys to take note. What do you do with repetitive motion? Walking is great. We love you guys to walk. But um, sometimes you guys swing your arms when you walk. So what is that? Repetitive motion. So you just want to kind of keep track of it and kind of maybe tuck your arms in. And it's kind of hard because when you do tuck your arms in, you don't swing, you kind of, your balance is off a little bit. So be careful. You guys can go on the treadmill, but you can't be doing this on the treadmill. You can be holding on the side with the treadmill, but I wouldn't go at a high speed. I just kind of be walking. I just never want anybody to fall. So those are the things that I just want you guys to kind of, you know, think about ahead of time. Um, and so you have somebody maybe to help you walk the dog, somebody help you um, to get to doctor visits and things like that with driving, and you know just having the food available and have people maybe help kind of clean, clean up the house for you. So that helps a whole lot. And I want you guys to invite friends over to keep you company because remember, there's not a whole lot that you guys can do because it's just you know. And just to let you know too, with the mouse, you know that's repetitive motion because a lot of people get on the computer. So one of the things is you can get the mouse with the ball. That helps a lot. And then just have lots of friends and family come over and keep you company so, and tell you good stories. How's that? That's the, that you can give them a job to do. So now, number two, just so you guys know, if you're at the end of the night and you feel like you walked into a brick wall, 
listen to your body. It means you overdid it. Because I already told you, your body's really good about letting you know if you overdid it. So don't repeat what you did the same thing the next day. And if you guys are going to go back to work, probably the recommendation that I've heard from a lot of patients, the first week you go back, go back half days. I've heard over and over again, I didn't realize how much the surgery took out of me. I felt great, but it does take something out of you. So go back just for half days that first day, okay? And then number three, this is a huge thing. So pain control, you guys. I had more of my patients call and complain and be in a lot of pain after the mastectomies before we started doing this class, and I haven't had anybody call since. What it is is you guys need to have very good pain control, okay? You cannot be a pain martyr. So how you want to do pain, think of pain on a scale from 0 to 10. 0 being no pain, 10 being the worst pain you had. You need to start taking a pain medication when you hit a 4. If you take a pain medication when you hit a 7, you waited too long and you need twice the amount of pain medication to get you back under control and you're not going to be a happy person. And it's actually going to hamper your recovery. So really, if you want to have a quick, speedy recovery, 4 is your magic number, okay? And a lot of my mastectomy patients have a hard time with this because they don't like how narcotics feel. They don't like, um, so I always tell you if you, there's a narcotic out there that you know that you can tolerate that doesn't make you nauseated, ask your sp surgeon for that specific narcotic instead of just letting them give whatever they want to give because, you know, some narcotics work better for other, than other, others for other patients. So definitely, you know, that's something to look at. What I tell you guys is if your surgeon allows you to take Motrin right after surgery, what you're going to want to do is um, take that one right away. So how you guys want to do it is you want to keep a pain log. And when I mean a pain log, I don't want you guys to write how much, t how much pain you're in or anything like that. The pain log is to remember when you took your medication. Because as much as you think you're going to remember when you take your medication, we don't. So kind of just have a little log and to write down when you take your pain medication. So when you can start taking your Motrin, you're gonna, I want you to take it as soon as you can when, you, when your surgeon allows you to. So what it is, is how you guys are gonna do it is you're gonna do Motrin around the clock and how you're gonna do it is you're gonna do 600 milligrams every six hours, okay? So, and this is gonna be your base, okay? So how are you gonna think about it is you're gonna take 600 milli milligrams of ibuprofen and you're gonna have the most amount of pain just for you guys to know the first two days after surgery. After day two, life gets better, just so you guys have that in your head. So especially the first like three or four days, this is a good idea just to kind of take it around the clock because Motrin works really good on inflammation pain. What is a lot of pain you're having after surgery? It's from inflammation pain. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna do the Motrin. So if you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, I need you guys to set your alarm for 4 a.m., okay? And you need to set your alarm for 4 a.m. and you have, need to have the three Motrin sitting next to you, and then you need to have some crackers and you have some water. Have your alarm go off, take your Motrin, your crackers, your water, and then go back to sleep. You don't have to get up. But what the key is not to let it wear off. If you have that as a nice base, you guys will do incredibly well. And what we find with that is that you have to take half the narcotics than you normally would have had to. So, and that's where a lot of the patients have a lot of the side effects and they don't like to take the narcotics because they don't like how it makes them feel. So, this is a great way to kind of help with that. So, what you guys want to do, remember I told you to keep track of that pain log. So, you're going to want to keep track of that because what's going to happen is you use that as a base. So as that base, and then when you're taking your Motrin every six hours and you get to that four, remember in your pain scale, you're at a four, then you can take your narcotics on top of it, okay? So that's why you want the pain log because it gets confusing about when you took what medication when. You can take Motrin products with your narcotics. And if you use them in combination together, a lot of times you use half the narcotics than you normally would have had to, so you have half the side effects from them, which is quite nice. It's nice to, to take the narcotics before you go to bed because they do make people sleepy and it's kind of nice to have, you know, help you sleep throughout the night. And you will have more pain at nighttime just because of the gravity of all day. And then believe it or not, because you're laying in bed and you have no distractions. <laughs> so, um, so it's not bad to take some narcotics before you go to bed. But now for the patients who can't take Motrin, um, if your surgeon um, doesn't want you to take them for the first couple of days after surgery or if you're allergic to Motrin products, then this is what you're going to have to do the same concept with your narcotics, is I want you guys to be taking them around the clock. So that means in narcotics, just so you know, you can take them every four to six hours, and you can take one to two tablets. 
So you're going to be able to, you're going to have to figure out what is your magic thing. So this is where you're going to have to figure out when you get to a four, you need to be taking something. And I never want anybody to get to a seven. So that's why if you go to bed and you're on narcotics, and you know you've been taking them every four hours during the day, you're going to need to set your alarm if you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, you're going to have to set it at 2 a.m. and take it, and that means you're going to have to set it at 6 a.m. So you're going to have to have lots of crackers and water next to your bedside. Just be really careful with a lot of those medications by your bedside if you have small children at home. So just to keep, take note of that. But this is where you guys just, just need to be kind of careful, okay, with the medications if um, other people are around. <laughs> but it's a great way for you guys to have great pain control. If you're under good pain control, you guys are going to be eating well, you're going to be walking, you're going to be doing all the things we want you to do, and you will recover a lot quicker. So that's the huge thing that I can tell you guys about pain control. And then if you do have any questions about what I've been telling you throughout this video, you can always give um, us a call and our cards are in here, or you can call your surgeon's office and they can help explain to you. Um, now the other thing is on the other side of the um, form, the sheet, it says, what do you guys need to call your health care providers for? So just to kind of let you guys know, the rule of the thumb of the operating room, the last surgeon to do surgery on you is the boss. So if you're having immediate reconstruction and your plastic surgeon was the last person, he's the person that you'll be calling, he or she is the person that you'll be calling um, if you have a complication. And you never want to wake up the wrong person in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. So I can tell you, so if you didn't have immediate reconstruction, you'll be calling your surgeon. If you did have immediate reconstruction, you'll be calling the plastic surgeon. So things that you need to call them for is if you have a temp over 101. So what you guys need to do is just take note, take your temperature. If you feel like you have the flu-like symptoms, if you feel like you want to go, um, if you want to go in the corner and have somebody shoot you, good rule of thumb, if you feel that way, you probably have a temperature, so just take your temperature. Or if you felt hot or flushed, take it. But if you do call your um, surgeon and you have a temperature over 101, please let them know when the last time you took a fever reducer um, because it's really important. And just um, to back up just a little bit, I want to make an important note that I forgot to tell you guys about earlier, is you can take Motrin and narcotics at the same time, but you can never take narcotics and Tylenol together. The reason why you can't do that is Tylenol is already in the narcotics, and so I never want anybody to overdose on the Tylenol products. I'm sorry, I kind of forgot about that important little piece of information to tell you. So if you took some Tylenol products, you're going to want to let the surgeon know, two hours ago I took a Tylenol, because if you have a temp over 101, that's actually way higher than just 101 if you already took a fever reducer. So what you need to call your surgeon for, for also, if you have a sudden increase of bright red blood in your tubes, and you guys know that. Remember, we already talked about that. You go from red, you're going to go to orange, and you go to yellow. If you're at yellow and all of a sudden it's bright red blood, give them a call, okay? But if you're bright red blood when you go home, that's normal. Remember, you're going to have that for the first couple of days. Um, if you're unable to keep any food or fluid down for about six hours, give your surgeon a call. You're probably having some kind of reaction to your pain medication or you just have the flu. Remember, we want you to guys have good pain control and we don't want you to get dehydrated. So give them a call if you're not doing well with that. If you have a sudden onset of pain in your surgical arm or site, and this is where um, you guys will, each of your surgeons will kind of let you know what to expect, what your dressing to look like afterwards. So what's going to happen is you're going to kind of feel, you're going to go, okay, I'm having pain. Just kind of lightly feel because if you feel like you're having a mound come back, your breast is coming back, remember we talked about that seroma. What is the seroma? It's a build up the fluid. Then you guys are going to want to milk your drain. Did it get plugged? And then if it's not working, then you want to give a surgeon a call because what we're hoping is that people don't end up with what's called hematomas. It's something that happens a couple of days, usually after surgery. Sometimes patients will say, I felt a popping sensation. It's where the cautery was, and it just kind of unpopped, and the bleeding is um, reoccurring in that site. It's, uh, doesn't, it doesn't happen very often, but in your package, it does talk about the three complications that can happen after surgery, which is, believe it or not, infections, uh, seromas, and hematomas. I do want you guys to read about those, because if you... It's not so scary if you understand what the process is happening and you can give your surgeon a call with your concern. So, but that would be why you want to give them a call if um, milking the drain doesn't resolve that. Um, the other thing that I tell you guys is, remember, you're not going to be changing your dressings the first week you're home. So you're going to see your dressing the first and the surgeon's office visit. 
So this is where I guys want you guys to take note when you go in there. Are you ready to look at it? So if it's not the place you want to be to look at your incision the first time, that is okay. Just tell the surgeon, I'm not ready to take a look at it, and they can put a dressing back on there for you. Um, I do tell you it's important for you to look at your incision as soon as you can. It's better. It's, it's been proven to help with the healing process. So when you're ready, you're, you're going to know you're ready. And this is where you may want somebody in the room with you, or you may want to be by yourself. But the best way to look at your incision is in the mirror. So take a look at it. But when you guys do go home, I need somebody to be looking at your incision. So if you're not ready to do it, somebody needs to take a look at it every day because we don't want to make sure it's getting infected. So what we wanted to do is pink and healthy because as the capillary is increasing um, to help it heal, um, that's totally great. But if it's angry red, that's not a good thing. So angry red, if it's red like this pillow, okay? <laughs> um, so if it starts getting red and oozy, you're going to want to give um, the surgeon a call. So really think about it after we have a um, stitches or things like that, you know, and after a week, it's kind of ready to almost not have dressings on it sometimes. So sometimes when you guys are home, what you guys really need is just that gauze just to kind of protect it against things. And it's nice and airy because really remember the good rule of thumb, you guys, for dressing care is to keep it clean and dry. Do not put any gunk on it. <laughs> so and then after when you're in the shower and you're drying it off, you're going to want to tap dry it, never blow dry it because remember it's numb and I don't want you guys to burn yourself. So that's what you want to do with your um, with looking at your incisions, okay? Um, and we already talked about number two, um, what you can do with your arms. This is number three, you guys, which everybody has a hard time with showering. <laughs> okay, your surgeon will let you know in your um, and their specific instructions when you can shower for the first time. Now, what I can tell you is um, no matter what anybody says, I do not want anybody to shower for at least three days. It takes three days for your incision to somewhat heal, seal up a little bit. We do have natural bacteria in our skin, and we just don't want to wash that natural bacteria on and get ourselves an infection just from our own bacteria. So it is important for you guys not to shower for at least three days. I know I'm probably hearing a lot of moaning from home. <laughs> at least in my classes, I hear a lot of it. Um, so what you guys can do is, you know, sometimes Rite Aid has a shower stool. They're about like $25. You can put it in your um, bathtub or in your shower. You can sit down, and you can kind of just take the hand hand shower and go here. You just want to keep where the drains are coming out and where your incision is dry, okay? Because remember, it's wetness of the dressing that can cause some problems. So that's the reason why we don't want you guys to shower. Now, some of your surgeons sometimes will put a tegaderm, which is a clear um, bandage, over that. And they'll, um, and, but I always tell you, even with that, it makes me a little bit nervous because if it, it has a little break in it, you can get it wet. So that's why I tell you, please just don't shower for at least three days. So you guys are all probably wondering, what are you going to do with your drains when you're in a shower? Because, I mean, you may have these four things. So in your package, all of you guys are going to have a little lanyard here like this. And this is what you may have been wondering what that safety pin for earlier was. And you just attach the safety pin to that. What it is is you just put the lanyard around your neck. And what you guys are going to do is the safety pin. And let me grab my drain out of here for you guys. And so what you're going to do is you're going to safety pin to your bulb. And then what you can do is you can have all four of your bulbs hanging from you in your shower. Because that's another thing. What do you do with them in the shower? People are like, do I throw them over the, do I put them in the soap dish? What do I do with them? So it's like, it's, this is a, a, a lifesaver for the shower, you guys. The other thing is that's nice with this, if you're trying to figure out what do you do when you're washing your camisole, this is a great thing just to have your drains hanging from too. So that's what you just need. That's why I said the bigger the better for the safety pin. So just to have an idea, this is why you guys have that. Each one of these, you'll have one of these. And you may wonder, what is that for? But I know it's nice to have these little things that help you guys along. So that's what you need for the showering, okay? And I, always a good rule of thumb is the first time you shower, I do want somebody home, and I don't want you to have the door locked, okay? So just make sure the door's not locked, because if you do need some help, I want you to be able to call for help from somebody. So, um, and showering just feels good, especially if you can uh, wash your hair. So just so you guys know, if you're not allowed to shower, you guys can wash your hair, and this is a great thing that you can kind of go back in the sink and have somebody wash your hair for you. I've even had people who've gone to the um, beauty, uh, parlors and get their hair done every couple of days or even the beauty schools and get their hair done just because if you have a clean head it just makes you feel so much better so um, that is my um, helpful hints on showering you guys um, 
Now, number seven in here talks about drain care, and we already went in quite detail about drain care, but it also talks to you about it again. The other thing is number eight, avoid tight clothing and jewelry. This is where I tell you I never want anybody to have to get their wedding ring cut off. So when you go to the operating room, please leave your jewelry at home. You can wear your, um, your wedding rings or your rings around your, on a necklace, but um, just wait until all the swelling from surgery um, happens. And I always tell you guys, never weigh yourself when you go home. I've had so many of my patients say, I wonder how much weight I've lost after my bilateral mastectomy. And they're quite disappointed when they gain weight. <laughs> and part of it is just from all the fluids and stuff from surgery. So yeah, don't weigh yourself for a little while. <laughs> The other thing is, I love number nine, and I don't know why they have it in here, but I guess it's for everybody. Um, avoid unnecessary ex uh, sun exposure. So basically, it's telling my patients, no nude sunbathing for a while, okay? I know we live in the uh, Washington state, so we don't see the sun very often, but in case you guys are going to a trip to Hawaii or maybe over to um, Europe on one of those beaches, um, please um, make sure that you cover up your incisions, okay? Um, number 10 and 11, this is actually quite important for you guys. Um, 20 years ago, everybody had mastectomies and everybody had all of their lymph nodes removed their arm. Remember we talked about sentinel nodes and axillary dissections in the beginning of the conversation. Remember the axillary dissection is when they remove a lot of lymph nodes. This is the only time when you have an axillary dissection that you're never allowed to get blood draws or blood pressures in that arm again. Think about it because you removed all those lymph nodes so you don't have the ability to fight infection from your arm again. So that's why you can't do blood draws or maybe even immunizations or shots. So this is like, think about this arm, is that you need to protect it against infections. You have to be very careful about it. Some people even get medical bracelets on there just so people don't do that. And it, remember, it's only for the axillary dissection. If you guys do the sentinel node, you can use, it, use that arm for blood pressures and blood draws, okay? We just don't want anybody to get lymphedema. Lymphedema is a lifelong swelling in the arm. It's not fun and it doesn't go away. Um, in your package, you'll have a little um, thing about lymphedema. Um, and especially with sentinel nodes, that's gone down a whole lot. Where we see a lot of patients that get their cells in trouble is the combination of is a mastectomy with the axillary dissection and then if you add radiation on top of it. So we really want to prevent that from a lot of people. Now, if you guys do have to do an axillary dissection, you're not ever allowed to, um, when you're gardening, you have to wear gloves. Okay, um, because think about you get little pricks on your finger. So anything that you think that you can injure your finger with, you just have to protect it. So when you're washing dishes, you may want to put some gloves on. You're never to shave your arm underneath your arm. But remember, a lot of my patients said they never got hair back. But if you do get hair back, you're going to want to use an electric razor, okay, not a a regular straight razor, okay? So those are the things that you're gonna to wanna to watch out for. Um, and if you do get a paper cut, life happens. If you get a burn, you wanna put some um, um, Neosporin on it, something um, like that, and then you're gonna to wanna to, um, put a Band-Aid on it and watch it. If you see red streaking, then you're gonna to wanna to go to the walk-in clinic or the emergency room to get it taken care of, okay? But um, you guys are all gonna be really good, so hopefully none of that stuff ever happens to you guys. Now, so if you guys, um, if one of the nurses from the hospital, when you get discharged, informs you that you can't use your arm for a blood pressure and blood draw, just nod and know that you guys are okay as long as you have a sentinel node. It's just hard because this is how we were all taught until the sentinel node just recently came out. So thank goodness that it came out, so we're really lucky with that. Now, um, just so you guys know, in your table of contents, you guys do have the mastectomy discharge information, which we went over. There's a section that talks about drain, um, drain care. And just so you know, it does have a section in here um, for you guys on a, bul um, a bulb drainage record for you guys to keep track of all of your drains. So that's quite nice. So you guys can keep track of it there. Um, and it does talk about the three complications. Believe it or not, it's really important for you guys to do breast exams after. You can still get a breast cancer with no breast. I'm sorry. I hate to say that to you guys, but you can. They can't remove every single breast cell. So after your surgery, you guys still need to do a breast exam on the side that had a mastectomy. You never need a mammogram on that side, but you do need to do your self-breast exam. So it talks about how to do that afterwards and also talks about how to do it um, after breast reconstruction. You guys need to learn to relax. It's a really important part of the recovery process. So it's more for your family to make sure that they're watching you to make sure that you know that you need to relax. It's hard to do, especially when there's dishes to be done and groceries to buy and all that. So um, the other thing is um, if you guys are having the mastectomy, a lot of you have seen a plastic surgeon to talk about breast reconstruction, but some of you guys haven't. So what we're going to do is a little bit of show and tell just to kind of show you what's out there and what's available for you. 
Um, just, I'm going to pull out right now what a normal prosthesis looks like. And this is a little bit bigger of a breast, just to let you know, but this is a normal prosthesis. And this is, um, fits into a mastectomy bra, and it has to be a little heavier because it needs to have the opposite breast needs to match that because you want evenness on your breast tissue for weight. And it's really important, if not, you can get a rolled shoulder, you can start getting um, shoulder pain, um, that kind of thing. So it's nice to have this um, prosthesis, especially if you're a little bit bigger breasted. Um, to make it a little bit even. Um, now if you have both your breasts removed, you can pick whatever size you want. You just need two of them. So that makes life a little bit easier. So this is what a prosthesis looks like. The other thing, believe it or not, um, if you guys are very interested in it, um, you can call me if you're um, our office. There's a few places that have what's called this custom prosthesis. They're a little bit more expensive, but they're really great for women who have one breast removed. And what they do is they go in and they scan your breast and they um, look at your scar tissue and um, they look at the opposite breast and they make the breast match, okay? And see how it has where they have the scar tissue back there. And what it does, it adheres on by heat. So you put it on and so it doesn't, it's not as heavy and it's great for women who are athletic because think about it, if you have a heavy prosthesis, it's gonna be bouncing with you when you're on working out where this is a little bit more attached, it's a little bit nicer for you guys. So just to let you know, and they do have swimming prosthesis prosthesis too out there. So there's lots of things and options out there for you guys. Um, but just to let you know, the other thing just to, um, if you guys are curious or not, in our breast reconstruction, a lot of our patients um, end up having implants put in. And so if you do have an implant put in, what they do is they put a tissue expander in first, and this is what a tissue expander looks like. And the tissue expander eventually gets, um, after you have your surgery, you'll go to the plastic surgeon's office. And what they do is they will inject um, some normal saline through this port. Remember your breast is a little numb, so it's quite nice, so it's not painful. And they'll inject the normal saline and they keep going in like every couple weeks until they expand this out until you decide that's the size you want, okay? Once you figure out, okay, this is the size I want, they pull it out and then they put the implant in. Just to let you know, we use a lot of silicone implants um, and they're great. The silicone's nice because believe it or not, um, it doesn't wrinkle as much and it feels a lot more similar to breast tissue. It's been proven to be safe to use for our mastectomy patients. So um, this is what it is. I do hear from some patients when it gets really cold out, these get kind of cold, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's one of the disadvantages, I guess, of an implant. Um, and some of you guys may um, move on to having what's called the DEEP procedure, and we're incredibly lucky because we have two great plastic surgeons here in town who do the DEEP. Um, if you guys do end up doing the deep, it's a microsurgery and you'll be in the hospital for a couple of days with that and you'll have some actually extra pre-op um, teaching from your plastic surgeon's office regarding that surgery. So, um, but, I'm trying to think of, um, so you guys just make sure you get those instructions from their office. Now, um, just so guys let you know, the last thing that we're going to talk about is sexuality. And I can tell you, sexuality is a huge, big issue with our breast cancer patients. And remember I told you, the mastectomy is not a big, huge surgery, but it's a big, huge emotional surgery. It's hard. You know, we, you guys never ask to lose your breast, and it's a huge thing. I mean, breasts are part of our world everywhere we go. We're in the grocery store, and there's breasts in the magazines. They're just everywhere. And, you know, clothes are made for breast. It's really hard. So um, what I tell you is we keep you guys so busy. Um, you know, think about all of the appointments we've given you. Um, think about, you guys are busy, so it's hard to kind of really think about it at this point. Um, I can tell you the surgeons and the oncologists and stuff aren't very good about talking to you about sexuality because it's just kind of an uncomfortable subject for them. Um, but what I can tell you is we have a great social worker at the Cancer Center, Don Dixon. She can talk to you guys. And we have some great people in behavior health that can talk to you at the Cancer Center. A lot of times sexuality, the issue of sexuality, doesn't come out until the end. Because we keep you busy. You guys are going through your treatment. And when you guys finally have a time to take a deep breath in and go, I'm done, and then you have time to think about these things. And it's hard. So what I do, and sometimes you guys get three hits on sexuality. One, you lose your breast. And then if you guys have to go through chemotherapy, you lose your hair. Um, and then if, we, if you weren't in menopause, we put in menopause. So it's a huge thing on sexuality. So, um, you know, we have people to talk to at the Cancer Center about it. Don't bury it underneath the carpet because it just gets really, really big. And I want you guys to be open about it and talk about it. And if you need somebody and you can't find somebody to talk to, just give, give us a call at the Breast Center and we'll help you.
um, in the right direction. The other thing that we have, um, which is great at the Resource Center, there's a Look Good, Feel um, Good program, and I want you guys all to sign up for it if you can. It's a great class. They have it twice a month, and it's a great thing to help you with that sexuality. They show you how to use wigs and how to use scarves and how to put your makeup on, and um, I can't tell you how many great kudos that I have gotten from women who've gone to that class. So please go to that if you guys can. So um, hopefully this helped you guys through your um, next step with your mastectomy. And please give us a call if you have any questions. And I wish you guys the best of luck.